graduated from um, John Marshall and I've been in practice for a few years. And I know that it can be, um, we're in our first year now, it can be challenging to try and find a balance between um, giving it your all in school and then also trying to find a balance with your social life. But I know it's much more challenging when you're actually in practice. So having been in practice for a few years, I want to know how when the case, whether you know good or bad, when it comes out, when you get the end result, how do you, you know, turn off the light in the office, lock the door, take that drive home and just compartmentalize and kind of try to, you know, you're still dedicated and passionate about your work at the same time there's a certain point where you have to kind of separate yourself for, you know, sanity's sake. And I wanted to know um, how you did that and if, if there's time, if you could give us a case that we have tried or challenged your ability to do that. I thought of one right off the bat, if you guys are. Um, Homeland Security again. <laughs> I can remember an example case. Well, first of all, um, there's a big difference between being a student and not having time and being an attorney and not having time. When it comes to being a student, it's, it's a grade and disappointing your professor or your parents or your spouse or the people around you. When it comes to being an attorney, someone's life is literally in your hands and that is a huge burden to carry. And when it comes to immigration, I tell people it's like being an ER surgeon. We lose people all the time because the, the relief and the laws are very narrow. They're just not there. And so from the very beginning, I make it very clear to the client who doesn't have a very clear path or, or how the case is going to end. I'm not going to promise you or guarantee you results, but I'm going to do everything possible to make sure you can stay here with your family or to get your work permit, green card, whatever it is. One example where the client really understood, even though we lost, um, that we did everything possible and that we weren't guaranteeing him the outcome. Um, I had a Venezuelan man who came in on a tourist visa and basically turned himself into Homeland Security claiming asylum. Atlanta is the toughest immigration jurisdiction in the entire nation. We have the lowest approval asylum rate in the entire country. Our judges basically treat them as a joke. They won't even entertain them. And Back when I used to do them, I had to remove myself from them. Emotionally, I cannot handle um, the, the stories and what we have to go through to represent these people. But in this case, we just lost. I mean, this man has been sitting in detention at a detention facility that, you know, Atlanta City Detention Center or some of the local jails or, or Disney World compared to the immigration detention centers. And we lost. He was very upset. The judge wouldn't explain why. I was trying to get an oral decision. And this is a judge that I have a good relationship that I see all the time. And he just wants to, you know, crack jokes and ask me how the practice is going and, and be nice to me while the clerk is getting the order printed and here I have this man in handcuffs who's about to get shipped back to Venezuela where he might possibly die. That's really hard. You want to be, I wanted to speak to the judge and I wanted to speak to the trial attorney and, but also show compassion to the client at the same time. And it was just the most awkward, uncomfortable thing and I, I can't tell you how to prepare for that, but I can't tell you to be prepared for that because it's going to happen. Uh, because your colleagues and the judges understand that this is work and you're not supposed to take it personal, but the clients don't always understand that. So the time is going to come and you just, you need to understand how to disconnect and that you did your best and then take it from there. <clears throat> I can give you a case that changed everything for me. Um, I'm in year five. Work-life balance is extremely important. I have a commitment to myself that I have to be healthy and I have to have a discerning mind and I have to have peace. So at 6 p.m. I cut it off. I come back in the next day or I come back in earlier, but I cut it off at 6. And the reason I did that is about two years ago, I was representing an African-American kid charged with aggravated battery in Gwinnett Superior Court. And the reason I couldn't get it out of my mind is because this kid was a football player who punched someone and broke their orbital socket after he was assaulted by the other kid who was a Caucasian. The prosecutor wouldn't listen to me about interviewing her witnesses who were telling the story that it was a self-defense issue. And so for the weeks leading up to calendar call and into trial, I was freaking out because the facts may not fall on your side. The law kind of fell on my side. And I just couldn't think about this kid going to jail for something that was clearly self-defense. And I just beat myself up over it. I kept trying to practice my arguments about what it required for aggravated battery, et cetera, element-wise. And so I wouldn't sleep at all. I'd just wait, wait, and wait to go prepare and prepare. And then when we went to trial, my work 
during the regular hours where I was a normal human, where my brain was working, it wasn't midnight thinking about it. I asked for a directed verdict because all her witnesses, the prosecutor's witnesses said, the Caucasian attacked the African-American, the African-American responded, the Caucasian fell to the ground, the African-American tried to help him up. I didn't even have to put any witnesses up. All her witnesses, I put up a directed verdict and the judge granted it. And my guy walked. Justice was served. But man, I lost sleep. I was a, I was a nutcase. I was a zombie. And so ever since that moment, I told myself, I'm doing the right work. My work is right. I'm thorough. At six o'clock, I cut it off because there are other relationships in my life that I have to maintain. And if those are not intact, the next day is going to be bad. And so that's how I cut it off. I just have a commitment that at six o'clock, I'm done. If I have to come in early, I will. But at six o'clock, it's time for me. I had um, uh, my last, my job pr prior to putting up my firm in June, um, I worked with a, a firm that was primarily, it was an Indian uh, law firm. And all the clients were either Indian or from Bangladesh or uh, Pakistan. Um, so I learned a lot about those cultures as well. And we took pro bono cases from a, a local community called Raksha. And they, they help uh, indigent individuals, uh, mostly females who were suffering abuse at the hands of their spouses or whatever, and they can't afford legal assistance, mostly from uh, India and uh, Bangladesh, some from Nepal too. Um, so that was very interesting. But we had one case where this uh, lady was, her husband wanted to take her little boy away because the, he was claiming that when she went to India to visit her family with the little boy, that the boy's uncle was choking the boy. Um, and I could see the pain in the client's face. And, and I really felt for her because I knew the whole thing was a lie. It was, it was, they were setting her up for, to fail. Um, it was just her husband was really playing her nasty and, and, it, and I, I try not to be partial one way you really have to be impartial because you have to have clear eyes to apply the law but some things really they, they get to you and I was losing sleep and I was really investing myself emotionally in this case uh, because you want to get good results as Dave, Dave said you want to see justice being served well we uh, went to court and, um, and and I remember telling my client over and over and over again is there anything else I need to know is there anything else you're not telling me that I need to know that could, is absolutely dispositive to this case and could ruin this defense in this case? No, 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 everything's fine. I'm telling you everything's fine. Um, and, and, you know, I would have to get through interpreters because she spoke a certain dialect of Haryana Hindi and not many people knew it and I certainly don't speak Hindi. Um, but through translators and this and that and we were able to get all the facts in a row. I had pictures, I had code pictures, I had everything. I'm ready to go. Opposing counsel tries to play a dirty trick with just basic service of process. Uh, thought I was an idiot, which I saw right through it. And I told the judge. The judge didn't do anything for me, so you're going to have that. Uh, I was already very upset with this case. Well, at the end, turns out my client lied to me about a few things. And turns out later on, my former boss calls me a couple months ago and says, Hey, what can you tell me about this case? Because she's going around uh, bad-mouthing Raksha, and she's bad-mouthing you in the community. And I told him exactly what I told him already five times over. For some reason, I guess he didn't believe me. Um, so the, the moral of the story was, yes, you can be invested in your case. Yes, you want to do a good job. And no, I'm not saying I'm jaded. But you have to be able to be prepared for disappointments, not just in the outcome of the case, but sometimes in the, in the, in the, in the shortcomings your, your own client will throw on you. And if you can be prepared for that, then you'll have a, a lot clearer mind and you're going to have a, a, you won't have as much of a weight on your shoulders because I was really disappointed. Um, the boy was pretty much taken away from her, but part of it, ultimately, as I found out, it was her own doing. And it just wasn't going to do anybody any good if I was going to be a, you know, a disaster because I couldn't help her, I couldn't get the, the, the result I thought I wanted to get her. So, I mean, that's just the way sometimes the, the cookie crumbles, so to say. Um, but you really got to know your clients and you got to get them to be as honest with you as possible. With regards to criminal cases, there's a whole different um, dynamic with that, which Dave could tell you all about that. But for the most part, you, you got to be prepared to, to take those curveballs. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Ivor Hines, and I'm a wonderful girl. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I think one of the biggest uh, questions that most of us have is uh, it relates to us attending this particular law school, John Marshall Law School. Mm. Um, I remember when I left uh, undergraduate, and um, a lot of my professors and my law school advisors told me, don't go to John Marshall Law School. 
you know, um, mm -hmm. go somewhere else. And um, I also remember going to a law firm here in Atlanta. I'm a native New Yorker, so I'm not familiar with the culture here. Um, I went to a law firm and I, I told the, um, the, actually the lawyer came out and greeted me. And he, uh, I told him, I said, hey, you know, I'm going to John Marshall Law School. And um, you know, I was thinking about coming in and doing an internship. And the guy said, we don't take anyone from John Marshall Law School. Go up to the 13th floor, they may have uh, something up there. And, you know, it really, I really started questioning, you know, um, the reputation of the school. I mean, I came and I met with uh, Dean uh, Jim, Jimison, and she gave me a really good presentation that resonated with me. And um, I thought, okay, you know, I don't care what these guys say, I'm going to go to John Marshall Law School. So now my question is, from you guys who've been here and graduated and started your own practice, how were you, is, did you, is, is the, uh, this idea that there's a stigma against us, is that real? And if so, how are you able to overcome that? Let me let uh, Dave answer. We probably got time for maybe one question out of that. So just one answer from Dave. So I'm going to tell you this. My criminal history, I had, I applied for 50 law schools because I had a fee waiver. 48 of them turned me down. John Marshall and Georgia State looked at me. And my thinking was, I did all the research, tier one, tier five, et cetera. But Lyman touched on this. The, the Constitution is the same at Harvard as it is at John Marshall. Your reputation will precede you if you choose to become what you want to become. We do have a uh, reputation out there, and it's that we make great trial attorneys. So to me, it doesn't matter whether it's John Marshall or Harvard. It's all the same. It's all on you. You do the work, you're going to get the result. I, I was hurt that all these schools turned me down, but I am more grateful that John Marshall gave me an opportunity. This is a family-oriented culture here. We look out for one another. We're family till the end. And so you should be grateful that you got, you got in here because the, it's a school unlike any other school. John Marshall will make a difference. The fact that you went to John Marshall is what's going to make you a good attorney. I, I promise you that. I promise you that. I, I will say this. I, I have yet to have one client ask me what law school I went to. Uh, and also, when I meet with other attorneys, they see me. They see my brand. They see my reputation. So where you, where you go to law school, I mean... I mean, unless you're going to, you know, one of the big, big law firms, a, a law degree from John Marshall is good. Uh, you don't have anything to worry about. I mean, I meet with other attorneys all the time and there's, I mean, I don't get the reputation of John Marshall that, that that's something to be diminished or looked down upon. So uh, keep pressing forward. I would not, I would not have come back for this panel if I thought something <laughs> wrong was wrong with going to John Marshall. Great school. But if I may add briefly, the fact that those firms told you we don't take John Marshall, they did you a fantastic favor. <laughs> because then you know right away, right off the bat, they filter themselves out. You know that that's not a place you want to work. That's not an environment in which you want to be. Uh, because there are a lot of attorneys that, no, we only take Emory, or we only take Mercer, or we only take UGA. Uh, it's, it's, it's a delusion. They're deluded. Because if we can tell you story after story of how many students have come from XYZ school, which, X, which XYZ reputation, and they're horrible. They're, they're, they, they're entitled, they're bratty, they don't follow through. Um, even, I've even heard stories of valedictorians from memory that fail the bar. So it doesn't matter, it's all up to you. I mean, do you believe in yourself? Yes. Do you believe in the law? Yes. Do you believe in the profession? Bingo, you're golden. The and there's plenty of us out there. We will look out for you. The way the administrators treated us is the way we will treat y'all when you guys get out. Guaranteed that. You'll see it, you'll experience it. We look out for one another. John Marshall takes care of John Marshall. I, that's what I was just about to add. Um, even though those law firms filter out, we won't take John Marshall, I filter in John Marshall. Where are the John Marshall students? Why aren't they calling me? Why aren't they contacting me? Um, I, I, will, I will spend time with a John Marshall student over any other law school. I don't care how great the resume of somebody else's. And, um, we want, you know, we want you guys to succeed just as much as we have, and we're going to pay it forward because we didn't get here by ourselves. People helped us as well. Absolutely. And I think that's a good note to end on. I want to thank all the panelists for attending. Thank you.